This is going to be 2 Samuel, and I want to talk about the subject of keeping your crown. If you want crowns. Number one, if you want crowns, don't rejoice when somebody loses theirs. In chapter 1, an Amalekite comes to tell David that Saul and Jonathan are dead. And I want you to notice the attitude that David has when he hears this news in 2 Samuel 1, 6 through 10. And the young man that told him said, As I, had, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord. So this man is, is lying to David, but David doesn't know it. And this man thought David was going to be thrilled about the news of him killing Saul, David's enemy, the man who's been trying to kill him. But it actually backfires on him. Even though Saul hated David and wanted David dead, David has an unusual reaction in the eyes of the Amalekite. In Second Samuel 1.11, it said, Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. So David is in agony about this news. And even though the Amalekite brought him saws, crowns, and bracelets, he's in agony. He's not rejoicing. And if you want a crown at the judgment seat, then don't rejoice when someone else loses their crown. David did not rejoice over the fact that Saul was dead. If you rejoice when your brother loses his crown, then there is a good chance in this uh, that you're not going to get a crown because it's showing your heart attitude might be all towards you having some glory yourself instead of the Lord getting the glory. I mean, when the Lord tries every man's work of what sort it is, none of your works are going to make it through the fire because if you're rejoicing over the fall of others and over everybody else losing their crowns, then there's a good chance that the works that you're doing were all for you and not for the Lord. And those type of works aren't going to make it through the fire. Some men are happy when a pastor gets a divorce. Some men are pa happy when a pastor has a wayward child or gets off into sin or uh, just kills over and dies or gets drunk or loses his temper. They're happy about it because they think, well, maybe I'm better than him. Not long ago, I seen a documentary by a group of Baptists where they are supposedly debunking a certain doctrine. And since they didn't have enough Bible to refute the doctrine, they had to dabble into the personal lives of those who teach the doctrine. And the documentary showed news footage about how one of their most hated preachers had a son who committed a murder-suicide. And they used that to teach against the doctrine that they hated so much. What does that have to do with Bible doctrine? They said, see, if he was a good man, then why did his son do this? Well, his son had a free will. His son is no different than that of Samuel's, David's, Adam's, and Jacob's sons. They all had sons that did stupid stuff. What does that have to do with anything? But they love to see you get off into sin. They love to see your child get off into sin because men love it when they see another man's crown get dented or falling off on the street and, and they jump at the opportunity to take your crown away. But David did not rejoice in Saul's death even though it would lead to him be, becoming king. In chapter 2, David is now made king over Judah because of this. In 2 Samuel 2, 4, And the men of Judah came and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. David had already been anointed to be king by Samuel a long time ago. He, he didn't have to kill Saul to get what, what was going to be his. You don't have to uh, knock somebody else's crown off to get a crown. You both can get a crown. In chapter 3, Joab kills Abner. And I want you to notice David's heart for people. He's always concerned about the death of somebody else. It says... And the king lamented over Abner in 2 Samuel 3.33. Notice David constantly mourning over the death of somebody else. 
And he's not rejoicing in anybody's death. Never. In chapter 4, 2 Samuel 4, 8, And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron. Now, Ishbosheth was Saul's son that reigned, started reigning over Israel after Saul's death while David reigned over the house of Judah. And I want you to notice that David doesn't even um, rejoice over Ishbosheth's death. In 2 Samuel 4, 8, And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron, and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life, and the Lord hath avenged my lord the king this day of Saul and of his seed. Once again, they think David is going to rejoice over a fallen king, but they're wrong. I mean, he may pray against his enemies sometimes, and he may he might rejoice in the in the death of a, a super wicked king from another nation, but he's not rejoicing in in the death of men like Ishbosheth and Saul. In Second Samuel four eleven through twelve, it says, "How much more, when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed, shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth?" And David commanded his young men, and they slew them, and cut off their hands and their feet, and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. So David was not for killing unless it was deserved, like in this case. These men, in his eyes, these men that killed Ishbosheth deserved death much more than he did. Men will try to win him over by pretending to kill his enemies or killing David's enemies. But I guarantee you, David knew that if these men would kill Ishbosheth like that, then they would eventually kill him like that. Don't rejoice in the death of an enemy. You don't have to be vengeful and mean back to your enemies. The Bible says in Romans twelve twenty one, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Even though the death of Ishbosheth was going to cause David to be promoted yet again, he still didn't revel in the fact that Ishbosheth was dead. And there are some Christians that are glad when somebody dies so they can get a promotion at work or inherit something that person had or get a certain position that they held in the church. And this reveals the wrong heart motive most times. You're not pleasing the Lord with an attitude like that. David wasn't trying to rack up on crowns through murder and fraud and deceit and lying and cheating and stealing. He was working for God and letting the Lord put the crowns on him as he went. And that's what was happening. Chapter 5, David is anointed king over Israel because of the death of Ishbosheth. It says in 2 Samuel 5, 3 through 4, So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. So notice that David didn't have to go against Ishbosheth. He knew the Lord was going to king him. And at 30 years of age, picturing Jesus Christ, because that is when he started his earthly ministry. Now in chapter 6, David messes up here. But you're going to notice that when David messes up, his heart is still right with the Lord. In chapter 6, the ark of God is put on a new cart. And David messes up sometimes, as you're about to see, but he's sincere because he's trying to bring up the ark. But he's sincerely wrong in how he does it. In 2 Samuel 6, 3, it says, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Ab Abinadab, drove, drove the new cart. So he put it on a new cart. But that's how the Philistines did it back in 1 Samuel when they took it. So this picture is a Christian trying to copy the world to get the job done. That's what they're doing today. But that's not a, a good idea if you want an incorruptible crown. 2 Samuel 6, 4, and 5, And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God in Ahio, went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. So they are sincere, and they have the right music, and they are praising the Lord, yet they still messed up. This shows that a group of Christians getting together with the right heart and the right music can still mess up. Look what happens. In 2 Samuel 6, 6-9, through 9, 
And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to, be ar to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perazuzza to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So the ark had to be carried a certain way. The fact that they were ignorant of this costed someone's life. And this shows you need to stick with the scriptures. Because the scriptures would have told them in Exodus twenty-five thirteen through 15 how to carry the ark. How was it supposed to be carried? And they didn't carry it that way. Their heart was in the right place. They had the right music. They just needed to have the right scriptures in mind to do a good job. And if there is an instruction manual or a tutorial on how to get a crown, then it's your King James Bible. You may have the right motive. You may have the right music. You may be living a good moral life. But if you don't have an understanding of the Bible, you're going to mess up because you don't have nothing to go by. So they end up taking the ark to the house of Obed-Edom. And the Lord blessed his house. So David ends up bringing it from his house to the city of David. And in 2 Samuel six thirteen through 15, And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. So David's rejoicing. But then his wife, Michael, is mad. She's upset. David was praising God with a dance. And just because someone is praising God by jumping and shouting and dancing doesn't mean that they're charismatic. It doesn't mean that they're fleshy. It doesn't mean that they're doing wrong just because the charismatics do it. You know, this is a good thing in the Bible. If it's sincere and with the right motive, done in the right way. And if these things are done with, with the right motive, then it's a good thing. You don't want to be like David's wife, Michael, who despises him in her heart for doing it. And Michael had the, a horrible heart motive of why she was upset. And it says in Second Samuel six twenty three. Therefore, the Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death because of this. Because her heart was so wrong in, in what she said to David. Now in chapter 7, David's son will build the house of the Lord. In 2 Samuel seven twelve through 15, it says, And when, all, when the day, thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of the, thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If, I commit, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from thee. David could have gotten mad that the Lord wouldn't allow him to build the house of the Lord. He could have been jealous of his own seed because of it. Some Christians get jealous of their own child. Some Christians get jealous of each other. They want to be the one in the spotlight. They want to be the one with the followers. Once again, David shows the right heart attitude that we need to have. He accepts what the Lord wants. If something good happens to another Christian, then he need to be happy about it. I don't understand why people get mad when something good happens to someone else just because it's not happening to them. In chapter 8, the Lord makes David a name. So this should remind you, don't worry about going around trying to make yourself a name. Just let the Lord exalt you. In 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourself, and God will exalt you. You've got to go down to come up. In 2 Samuel 8, 6, Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts, and the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. God takes care of David cons consistently and constantly, and I believe this is because David's heart was right with God, even when he messed up. 
<laughs> Even when he did some horrible things, he never justified the things that he did. In 2 Samuel 8, 7 through 8, it says, And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Beda and from Berita, cities of Hadadezer, King David took exceeding much brass. And then in verse 11, it says, Which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated of all nations which he subdued. So all the stuff he got, he brought them to the Lord. He wasn't so much concerned with gold and brass down here for himself as he was with what was waiting up for him in heaven. And as it says in Matthew six nineteen through 21, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on the earth. It says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Second Samuel eight thirteen, And David got him a name, when he returned from smiting the Assyrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. David is a man of war. He got himself a name. The Lord gave him a name. And he wasn't like those guys at the Tower of Babel trying to make themselves a name. So chapter 8, David gets himself a name. The Lord gave it to him. Just serve God. Don't try to be the best. Don't try to be the greatest. Don't try to knock people off from the throne. Don't try to take their crown. You do the Lord's work and God will give you a crown and make you a name. That's how you can keep crowns. Chapter 9, you see a man, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth sees himself as a dead dog. In 2 Samuel 9, 1, it says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show kind him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Once again, see where David's heart is. His He's going to show kindness to the house of Saul. Saul is his enemy. He's going to show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And in this story, Jonathan pictures the Lord Jesus, and David pictures the Father. And the Father is showing kindness for Jesus' sake. David is a man after God's own heart. Both of them show kindness when they don't have to. In Ephesians 4.32, it says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You see, before you were saved, you were the enemy of God. But when you got saved, the Lord showed you kindness for Jesus' sake and took away your sin. He's going to let you sit at the sit at his table, and you'll eat at the king's table continually. And Mephibosheth pictures me and you. David pictures the Father, and Jonathan pictures Jesus Christ. David is going to show Mephibosheth kindness for Jonathan's sake, just like the Father showed us kindness for Jesus' sake. In 2 Samuel 9, 3, And the king said, Is there yet not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan yet hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. So we also were lame on our feet. We were walking in darkness before we met the light of life. And so Second Samuel 9, 7 through 8, And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat at bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? That's the right attitude. Mephibosheth said, David, why you want me? I'm just a dead dog. If you're coming to God, you need to approach him knowing that you are more unworthy than a dead dog. I mean, you don't even want to run over a dead dog. They're so nasty. And that's what your sin does for you. It makes you that nasty. But God wants to show you kindness for Jesus' sake. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Mephibosheth was lame through a fall. Me and you are lame through a fall. Adam and Eve fell in the garden. Ever since then, we've had problems. Now, chapter 10, David wants to show kindness to Hanan. Once again, notice where the heart of David is. In 2 Samuel 10, 2, it says, Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants, where his father and David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. So David wants to show him kindness. So once again, see where David's heart is. People are not used to kindness, so they think there's something sinister behind it. They think it's a trick, just like in this story. It says in verse 3 in Second Samuel 10, And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? 
Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? You see, they think it's all a trick to search out the city and let her overthrow it. They don't realize David's really wanting to show kindness here. So Second Samuel 10, 4 and 5, it says, Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. <coughs> Excuse me. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed, and the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. So they got the wrong idea, and David's kindness turns into a big war. But look who, look who comes out on top at the end. Second Samuel 10, 19, When all the kings that were servants at Hadadezer saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon any more. So note, you're going to notice the theme that when men go against David, God preserves him and protects him and his enemies fall. This is because David's heart is right with the Lord. Your heart being right with the Lord is going to take you so far. Chapter 11, The Sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. Now this story is the smudge on David's record. However, it isn't mentioned in the New Testament because the Lord forgave David for it a long time ago. 2 Samuel 11, 1, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent to Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Notice it was at the time when kings go forth to battle. David should have been in the battlefield. You want a crown? Get in a fight. If David had been out on the battlefield, he wouldn't have been in this situation. You want a crown? Stay in the battle. Second Samuel eleven two, and it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. You see, it starts with a look. Don't let a woman take your crowns. Bathsheba should have had a shower curtain, but she should have had. Uh, David should have had enough sense not to look. And Second Samuel eleven three and David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David knows this is another man's wife. He's going to commit adultery. Second Samuel eleven four and five and David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child so now she went and took a pregnancy test it comes back positive she lets david know and david's in a hurry to cover up his sin and has uriah come up come up to meet him and he, he gets him drunk and everything else and he hopes he's going to go back home to his wife and lay with her so that he thinks the child is his own but he doesn't go back home so David sends a letter to Joab, and he wrote in the letter in Second Samuel eleven fifteen, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and return ye from him that he may be smitten and die. So David commits murder and adultery, and good men can mess up and mess up bad if they don't stay right with the Lord and stay on the battlefield. And then you're going to see in chapter 12 where Nathan tells this story about so a man still in another man's lamb to illustrate what David did with Uriah, and he tells him, "Thou art the man." And he, and Nathan lets him know that the Lord told him what David did. And notice, I want you to notice David's heart attitude about it in Second Samuel twelve thirteen. You see, even though David is caught in a horrible sin, he admits to it and confesses to it. And David said unto Nathan, "I have sinned against the Lord." And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. You see, under the law, David should have been put to death for murder and adultery. But the Lord put away his sin. And this picture is what the Lord did for us. When Jesus came into our heart, the Lord put away our sin. And now we'll never die spiritually. In verse 14, it says, Howbeit by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. When you mess up in sin, not only can it hurt your crowns, but it gives lost people an opportunity to talk bad about Christians and the Lord. David ends up losing the child with Bathsheba because of his sin. But he does have Solomon by her, as you'll see in 2 Samuel 12, 24. 
It says, And David comforted Bathsheba his wife, and went in unto her, and lay with her. And she bare a son, and called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. The Lord loved Solomon. This brings comfort to me, because Jesus Christ is greater than Solomon. And Jesus Christ lives in me. His righteousness is on my record. His blood is on my soul. All that happened at the moment I was born again. All those things took place. And I bet in the record book for the body of Christ, after it says our name, it probably says, and the Lord loved him. So the Lord loves you, just like he loved Solomon. And David experienced a great sin and failure on his part, but this doesn't mean it has to be over. Just because you did something horrible doesn't mean you can't earn some more crowns. Because after this, in 2 Samuel twelve twenty nine through 30, it says, And David gathered all the people together and went to Reba and fought against it and took it. And he took their king's crown from off his head. The weight whereof was a talent of gold with the precious stones. And it was set on David's head. Notice that David defeated, won some battles. Somebody else put the crown on David's head. It was set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. Even if you have been away from God, you can confess your sin. And he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. David got back in the battle. And he got another crown put on his head. You can get back in the battle and get another crown put on your head. Even after a big sin in your life. I mean, most likely the people listening to this have never committed adultery or murder, let alone in the same week. Now, chapter 13, David's son Amnon goes wayward. Amnon had a friend. Ever since the sin with Bathsheba, you see that David struggles with the people in his life. In 2 Samuel twelve ten through 12, it says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me. And hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly. Secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. So that shows you that the Lord is going to make David reap what he sowed. But now you're going to see how David's own children cause him grief. David's son Amnon falls for his own sister, as it says in Second Samuel thirteen two. But Amnon had a friend Jonadab, who influences him to go through with his lust for his sister. And it says in Second Samuel thirteen fourteen through fifteen, howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice. This is Amnon and his sister Tamar. She's telling him that she wants nothing to do with him. And he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. So he raped her. And it says, Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. So isn't this something? When Amnon fulfilled his lust, he didn't want anything more to do with her. And that shows you the Bible is so relevant today. Many times a man will be all over a woman and the moment she gives in to him to fulfill his lustful desire, he's done with her. He doesn't respect her and he moves on to the next one. And while that same woman keeps a desire toward him because of what they just did. The Bible is very up to date and actually has a way, is way ahead of you. and It's way ahead of your thoughts. But he hated her even more than he loved her after he raped her. And David's other son, Absalom, finds out what Amnon did and kills him. David's house is in a mess. Absalom applauded the death of Amnon from the day that he had raped his sister. So David lost his baby. And he, here he loses another child. His virgin daughter is raped by her own brother. And then Absalom, David's son, kills Amnon, David's son. His house is in a mess. In 2 Samuel 14 through 15, you got the story of Absalom. Absalom is David's son, but becomes one of the greatest enemies in David's life. Now, this is one of David's sons, Absalom. It says in 2 Samuel 14, 25, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. He's someone that people would cling to because of his charisma and his looks. Uh... 1426 shows you that Absalom was known for his long hair. 
And Absalom is a messed up character. For two full years, he saw not the king's face. It says in 2 Samuel fourteen twenty eight. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. And sometimes you get away from the King James Bible. And it turns into years without sticking your face in it. That's where Absalom messed up. He was away from his father. There was no relationship between Absalom and David. David should have had a better relationship with his children. But he had saw not the king's face for two years. You need to make sure that you stay in your Bible every day. You need to see the king's face every day. Second Samuel fifteen five, And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. So a Absalom, he's a flatterer. He, he likes to just pet people and, and, you know, just eat people up. He's got the charisma stuff. And so he, when, when somebody came to him, he put a, a man would come to him, he'd put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And I know this is okay in some cultures, but uh, I, don't, I don't think you want to be kissing on a, a pretty boy with long hair, or any man for that matter. It's just weird. In 2 Samuel 15, 12, And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gala, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. So Absalom betrays David and gets David's counselor. The conspiracy is strong. The conspiracy. It was all over Infowars. It was all over Now the End Begins. It was all over the Jason A videos and the Daily Wire couldn't stop talking about it. It was all over Facebook. Second Samuel fifteen thirteen and 14. And there came a messenger to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee. For we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. So was David really worried? Or did he just not want to fight his own son? David had a heart for people. I know he did the horrible thing with Uriah. But when a man is away from God and in a panic, he's going to do some crazy things. And I mean, his, he, he, he confessed his sin and forsook it. But David has a heart for people, especially for his own son. I believe he wants away from his son, not because he's afraid, but because he doesn't want to have to kill his own son. In chapter 16, you're going to see a man named Shemaiah curses David. You see, everywhere David goes, he's got men going against him. They're consistently going against him. And in chapter 17... Well, back in chapter 16 also, you got Absalom. In 2 Samuel 16, 22, Absalom puts a tent up on the top of the house and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Remember how we talked about before how uh, the Lord said that David's women would be taken by his neighbor, taken by other men, and it would be in the sight of all Israel. That's what happens, but it's with his own son. His own son goes into his, his own women goes into David's women. And David was being humiliated in front of everybody. You know, everything about his life is just is going down the drain because of he's reaping what he sowed. And now chapter 17, you got more plotting against David. In 2 Samuel 17, one moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. Ahithophel is a backstabber to David. But look what happens to him. In 2 Samuel 17, 23, And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Ahithophel is one of the seven suicides in the Bible. You'll notice that David's heart is right with the Lord. And even though he's just being just clobbered by, by words, and by uh, people in his family causing him heartache, his enemies around him are dying off. It's like he's being cursed and blessed at the same time. In chapter 18, you got Absalom killed. His son Absalom is killed. Even though Absalom killed Amnon, even though Absalom betrayed David, 
David still wants them to deal gently with Absalom. As it says in 2 Samuel 18, 5, And the king commanded Joab and Abisha and Atiah, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. This reminds me of the Father's mercy with us. We've betrayed him, we've done him wrong, and he still has mercy on us. David did wrong a few chapters earlier, but his heart is right, and that's why he gets so much mercy. In Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Remember that the next time you go off on somebody and put your crown in danger. The merciful will obtain mercy. But even Absalom dies. Notice how it seems that everyone who goes against David ends up dying. In 2 Samuel 18, 9 through 11, And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak. And he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him. Why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in hearing the king... Charge thee and Abisha and Atiah, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. So David, he does not want Absalom dead. He does not want Absalom hurt. Even though Absalom's doing all these things to him, if you want a crown, don't reward evil for evil. Reward evil with good. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. David never wants to hurt Absalom or Saul. But Absalom ends up being killed, and you're going to notice that David's reaction is not good. In 2 Samuel 18.33, he says, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David would rather have died for Absalom, who was just trying to destroy his life, just like Jesus died for us, even though we were wicked. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. David is a man after God's own heart. He's got a heart for people. He's got a heart for God. In chapter 19, the people are mad because David isn't celebrating the death of Absalom. And chapter 20, a man named Sheba steps out against David. He's got enemies coming out against him everywhere. But look what happens at the end of 2 Samuel 20. Sheba dies. Another one bites the dust. Notice that when your heart's right with God, and when you're when when you got a heart for God, when an enemy comes against you, if you got the right reaction, those enemies may torment you for a while. But it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. His enemies are just falling down in front of his eyes. He's not even doing it. The Lord's doing it. The Lord's having those enemies put David through some things, but David's keeping his crown. Because he's having the right reaction. And the Lord is recompensing tribulation to them. Now chapter 21, you got an interesting chapter. And this shows how friends can help you keep your crown. In Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. In 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 16, it says, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him, and they fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbi Binab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So this giant about kills David. The giant had a new sword. He had one of those new ESV Bibles. But it says in verse 17, But Abisha, the son of Zeruiah, succored him, and smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. So Abisha succored him. That means he helped him, assisted him, relieved him. And if it wasn't for him, Ishbi Binab would have taken David's head off and his crown too. And I'm sure he knew David had killed his daddy slash brother Goliath. So he wanted David's crown. He wanted his head cut off, just like he had cut Goliath's head off. 
but his friend helped him, Abisha. Your friends can help you keep your crowns. That's why it's good not to be a lone ranger. And 2 Samuel 21, 18 through 20, And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibaka, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jeri or a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where there was a man of great stature that had on, had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. So a giant like this, with six fingers and six toes, six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot, he'd love to get all twelve fingers on your crown and yank it off and stomp on it with all uh, twelve toes. But Second Samuel 21 21 through 22. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. It wasn't just David that killed these men. It was also his servants. Sometimes you want to look like a big dog and try to beat up all the giants yourself, but it doesn't hurt to have help keeping your crown. People can help you keep your crown. In chapter 22, you got David's song of praise. You want to keep your crown? Set your affection on things above, on God. Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. If your mind's down here, on things down here all the time, then it's not up there. And you're not going to obtain a crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Are you looking up in praise, thinking about an incorruptible crown? Or are you looking down here, thinking about a corruptible crown? In chapter 22, David's singing his song of praise. In chapter 23, you got David's last words, and it talks about his mighty men. And if you're obtaining your crown, then you're a standout. Just like many times in sports, they call a good player a standout. David's mighty men were standouts. The people that are earning a crown down here, they may not stand out to the world. But if, you're, if you are familiar with church history or Christianity, you know there's some standout people that really stood out in church history. Just like David's mighty men stood out. And you can read about all their mighty acts here in Second Samuel 23. I've, I've got into their mighty acts so many times that I won't get back into it again. But they were standouts in the faith. You need to be a standout. Not trying to be one. But you become a standout just by going through your Christian life, serving God, doing your best for Him. Chapter 24, you got the, another sin that David committed where he numbers Israel. And that should make you realize, don't put confidence in numbers. It's the Lord that's going to get you the crown. Get up every day, serve God, do what the Bible says for you to do. And through you, God will help you earn the crown. It's not about numbers. It's not about how many people you have. It's not about numbers. It's, it's quality over quantity. And at the end of Second Samuel, look what David does. And David built an, there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. So David messed up. All of sinning comes short of the glory of God. But David had a heart for God. At the end of the book, what's David doing? He's offering sacrifices to God. So through this book, you've seen David win some battles. You've seen him lose some battles. You've seen him almost die. You've seen him get off into sin. But look what he's doing at the end of the book. He's finishing his course. Just like Paul said, I, I finished my, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. So if you want to keep your crown, finish your course. You're going to fail. You're going to succeed. But make sure you finish.